Hello and welcome to another edition of Monday Night Calculus. My name is Curtis Brown. I am joined by Steve Kokoska and Tom Dick. Once again, it is so great to see you guys uh, and great to have you helping us out with some calculus questions. Uh, this session is a your questions, our answers uh, type session. To the teachers who are joining us, thank you uh, for taking your time uh, out this evening to join us live. We certainly encourage you to put your questions in the chat box. I know Steve has collected a number of your questions from Facebook and email and a number of other sources, so I think he's ready uh, with several things. And Tom's got some technology tips uh, to showcase for us this evening. And again, I want to, I also just want to thank uh, our friend Allison uh, Steele for hanging out with us on uh, the background. She does an awesome job organizing the three of us to make sure this production uh, goes off smoothly. So uh, really great shout out to her. And also, I just want to uh, shout out to any students who have joined us this evening. Go ahead, put your questions in the chat box. These guys are very approachable. Uh, we love uh, working with them, and I hope that you uh, can gain some things from this evening as well. So, Steve, I will uh, turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Curtis. Tom, great to be with you again. And Allison, one of these nights we're going to see you rather than just that uh, icon on the screen. But thanks for everything you do in the background. Curtis, there were some absolutely spectacular questions, I think, on the Facebook page this week. I don't know if we'll have time to get through all of these unless you can stay till about 10 o'clock Eastern time. But we're going to do the best we can. We have some great questions here. So this first one uh, is from Ashley. I'm not going to try the last name, but this is a good, solid question. We see questions like this on the AP Calculus exam frequently. And I'm going to add a little bit more to this, a little literary license here. It started out with, if x is greater than 1, then find the derivative of the integral from e to x of 1 over t dt. Well, this is a pretty, I think, straightforward question, which depends upon the fundamental theorem of calculus, the most important theorem in the entire course. There's a part one and a part two, as we usually teach this. Uh, the first part relates the derivative in the integral. And in my mind sort of says that the derivative in the integral are inverse operations. That is what one does, the other undoes. There's a couple of typos in here. I apologize, Curtis, as we put these together quickly. If f is a continuous function on this closed interval a to b, then the function g, there's a missing sort of space in there, defined by this function. Now, that's sort of an odd function for many of our students to see. We're not used to seeing a function defined this way in terms of a definite interval. Notice that the lower bound a is constant. The upper bound is variable x. And notice that the way that I define this, I do indeed use a different variable in here, t. I think that's the proper way to do it, although we tend to be pretty lenient in grading this on the AP exam. If g of x is defined that way, it is a continuous function on the closed interval a to b. It's differentiable on a to b, and son of a gun, the derivative of g, g prime is equal to that integrand f of x. Unbelievable theorem relates differentiation and integration. And with that theorem in my hand, it's pretty easy to answer, I think, this question. What's the derivative of this definite integral? Well, it is in this form, a constant down here is the lower bound, the variable x up here. Yes, we really ought to check to make sure that that integrand is continuous. It is indeed continuous on what opens zero to infinity, so that's fine certainly from e to infinity. And so the derivative of that is simply one divided by x. So that's pretty straightforward application. And again, I think it's pretty common to see questions like this on the multiple choice portion of the exam. But you know, I got a couple of extras here. So let's take a look at this one. Always, you've always got something <laughs> extra that you've thought of, Steve. Oh, they didn't ask this though. They should have asked this. That's they should have asked this. They should have asked this. Your creativity, Steve, never <laughs> fails. All right. So here's a new function g, which is defined to be the integral for sine of x to 1 of the square root of 1 plus t to the 4 dt. Now, one sort of aside, uh, Curtis, 
you know, frequently when students see a problem like this, and I'm going to ask, I, I didn't put this in here, but what I really want to find here is g prime of x. What's that equal to? And when students see a problem like this, some, not many, but some will look at this and say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first try to find an antiderivative of this expression. Well, in this case, you can't. You can't find a closed form antiderivative of that. No nice substitution here that I see. Oh, maybe I should take that back. Maybe there's some sort of trig substitution or inverse trig substitution, but I don't see anything easy. Now, I'm going to do this in kind of a, a long, gory detail here because I like to see where everything comes from. And this is just me. I like to use the properties and theorems that are available. And you know, Curtis, that I'm really big on problem solving. So I like to relate things back to something that I know about. So the very first thing I'm going to do is apply a property of integrals here. I'm going to switch these bounds. Yeah. And when I do that, I have to put a negative sign out in front. Now, this isn't in the form of the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, because what's up here in that upper bound is not just x, not just the variable x, but rather a function of x. And so what I'm going to have to do is use the chain rule here. I'm going to have to think of this as a composition of functions, where the inner function is u equal to the sine of x. So I'm going to make this extra step and write this as, well, there's the minus sign. I want to take the derivative of the integral from 1 to u of this expression, where u is equal to the sine of x. How do you do that? Well, you start at the outside and you work your way in. I'm sorry about this. Here's the one typo here. That should be a u. I want to take the derivative with respect to u of the outside function times the derivative of the inside function du dx. There it is on the end. Well, the derivative of the inner function is really, again, just the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. So it's evaluate this integrand at that variable. There it is. The derivative du dx, where's u? It's sine, so that derivative is cosine. And to get to here, I just plugged in for u sine to the fourth. Maybe that's a little bit more simplification or a prettier way to write that, but that's a nice problem. Now that you've seen the way that I do those sorts of problems, I'm going to skip a couple of steps here in this one. This is a cool one too. Here's g of x defined to be the integral from minus x squared to x squared of 1 divided by 1 plus t squared and I want to find g prime of x. Now, somebody out there, let's see if some of the students know this. Can you find an antiderivative of that? If you really wanted to, could you do that? That would be a really, I think, long-winded way to do this and prone to more errors, but I think you could do it that way if you really wanted to. But I'm going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus here. And before I can do that, I'm going to use a property of integrals, definite integrals. And I'm going to split this up into two separate integrals. I can choose any constant I want, really. So I'm going to choose a nice convenient one, zero. So this becomes the integral from minus x squared to zero plus the integral from zero to x squared. OK, in my way of doing things here, I'm going to switch the bounds over here to make this look a little bit like the FTC. There's the negative sign out in front. And now I recognize that both of these definite integrals are almost in the form of the FTC, except I have functions up here for the upper bounds. Now, I'm not going to go through this one in gory detail, but I'd have to use the chain rule once again. And Tom, make sure I've got everything right here. There's a lot of minus signs in here. So this becomes 1 divided by 1 plus that upper bound minus x squared squared. There's the derivative of the inner function. 1 divided by 1 plus x squared, that upper bound squared, derivative of the inner function. And let's see a little bit of simplification. And that one's 4x divided by 1 plus x to the fourth. 
So I'll leave you with this thought here. If you want to think about this one, if you want to try to solve this the other way, can you find an anti-D first, an antiderivative first, and then plug in those bounds and get the same answer? And then you decide which way is the easier way to do this one. So that's a good solid question here about the fundamental theorem of calculus. I think a lot of teachers, a lot of students are at that point in the course now. They're getting to integration. They probably got to the FTC. That's a nice problem to start out with. Any questions, Curtis? I don't mean to bother you there. No, Thanks you're OK. I okay. have not seen a, a question come in, Steve. We've got uh, quite a few folks out there. Um, but uh, nobody commented even on your on your question okay. uh, whether uh, you could actually do uh, the long winded version there. I know <laughs> that uh, okay. I know that if it's prone to mistakes, I would make a few. Oh, uh, well, let me ask one non math question. <clears throat> if anybody out there is from Canada, or if we have anybody listening from Marco Island, let us know on the chat. Okay. Canada or Ireland? Those oh, seem no, very no, 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 not, not Ireland, Marco Island. Oh, Marco Island. Marco Island, okay. All right, that's even more specific. Okay, here we go. Um, we saw a question similar to this a few weeks ago, but this one is better. This one's even more interesting to me. This was, I think, by uh, Denise Wright on the Facebook page. And this says, find the equations of any vertical tangent lines to the graph of this relation. And, and you know, Mark, the way that this is stated, there might not be any. Mark did say that you could uh, consider it from a systematic approach since it was a uh, symmetrical approach since it was even. Oh, that's a good idea too. Yeah, that's very good. Okay, very good uh, idea. But outside of that, uh, only one other person commented that uh, perhaps if they read several books um, and compared <laughs> uh, calculus physics for college, uh, so I think the, uh, the point was well taken, Steve. Okay. Well, good. This is an interesting one. Uh, my first thought here in looking at this, and if you remember back a couple of weeks ago, Curtis, uh, we, were actually take, we were actually able to take the relation here, and we were actually able to solve for y in terms of x. And I don't think we can do that here. At least I can't see a nice, easy way to do that. So we're going to have to use implicit differentiation. We're going to have to start out by trying to find an expression for dy dx. So here we go. Don't let me make any mistakes. I'm going to use implicit differentiation. Here's the relation right here. Whoops, where's my pen? There it is. I'll take the derivative of both sides with respect to x. Let's see, in this line, 12x squared minus 4 times the derivative of y is 1, times the derivative of the inner function, dy dx. On the right-hand side, 4y cubed, derivative of the inner function, dy dx. And OK, the rest of this is maybe just a little bit of algebra here. So let's see. In this step, I brought all of the expressions that included a dy dx. I brought them all to the left-hand side. And I actually multiplied everything by a minus one to get rid of those minus signs. Did a little bit of factoring here, factored out a dy dx, and then finally solved for dy dx and did a little bit of simplifying here. So, okay, how do I find those places where there is a vertical tangent line? Hmm. Well, what I have to do here is I have to check if there are any places, any values of x and y, such that the denominator, the denominator is equal to zero. Hmm. I got a couple questions coming up here, Curtis. So I'm going to set one plus y cubed equal to zero. And, and I skipped a couple of things in here, but I can really see one solution there for sure, which is y is equal to minus one. I'm going to write this a little bit differently just for my own sake. I'm going to write that as y cubed plus 1 equals 0. Well, I'm going to just think out loud about this, and then somebody's going to have to give me an answer to this. You know, that's a cubic polynomial. And it sure seems like that cubic polynomial ought to have three roots. And I got one of them, but I don't seem to be worried about the other two. So I wonder why. 
There's one question. Holy Toledo. I'm going to put a little one with a circle there. Now, I have a line in here that says, well, you know, before I go on any further, before I jump to any conclusions, I better find the corresponding value of x because I have to make sure that that numerator is non-zero. Oh, wait a minute. Here's the second question. What do you do? What would I have to do if it turns out when I find the value of x that that numerator is zero? What would you have to do? Do you throw your hands up and say, ah, I'm done. There's no possible vertical tangent. Or what do you do here? That's an excellent question. Hmm. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this value of y and I'm going to go back to my original relation up at the very top of this page. I'm going to solve for x, and I think this is the symbolic value of x. And in AP calculus lingo to three digits, I think it's minus 0 0.909. So I'm going to do a quick check. I know the only way I can make that numerator zero is if x is zero. So certainly the numerator is non-zero. So I'm feeling pretty good about this. I've got an X and a Y value where the numerator is non-zero, where the denominator is zero. I'm pretty sure I have a vertical tangent line there, but you know what? I'm going to get a little graphical support for this, and here it is. Now, Tom is going to take a look at a couple of things in a second, but the way that I produced this graph was with Mathematica. Mathematica has a built-in command. I think it's called contour plot, which allows you to graph these sort of implicit uh, relations here. And this is kind of a cool one. And this is the exact point that we found. There's the X value. There's the Y value of minus one. And son of a gun, it sure looks like there is a vertical tangent line there. And that's just a great problem. I think there are lots of little things going on over there. I'm going to turn it over to Tom in one minute. Curtis, did we get any answers to these two questions? I did not get an answer to either of those questions. Uh, I was thinking about them myself, but I didn't have an answer either. Okay, well, we'll leave those open. How do you like that? Everyone is still reveling in the Patriots' destruction of the Cleveland Browns yesterday, which is which is okay. Now, let's couple. I'm minutes. sure that that's exactly it, it what everybody is uh, totally on board with. It could be. <laughs> now, we have had a few students uh, chime in this evening, uh, right. which is great, uh, but nobody's uh, answered your questions. All right. Well, let me point out a couple of things that look like are happening on this graph, and then I'll hand it over to Tom. You know, another nice question here might be well, are there any places on the graph? where there are horizontal tangent lines. And you know, it kind of looks to me like there's one there somewhere. I mean, I'd have to zoom in there a little bit more to see exactly what's going on, but it looks like there might be a horizontal tangent line there. It also looks like there might be another one around here also. And you know, I didn't graph much more of this function to the right of three actually, x equal three. So I don't know whether or not, you know, this might tail off like this or come down over here. I don't know if there's any other tangent lines over there. So I'm going to ask that question maybe of Tom, and I think he's going to take a look at a little technology to try to answer that. Tom. Okay, thanks, Steve. And I'll share my screen. And... Um, you guys can give me some uh, feedback, see if I'm successful here. I'm pulling up a TI Inspire. Yes, sir. Oh, look at that. That looks <laughs> like it might have had something to do with the previous question. <laughs> How do you like that? So, so that's the actual uh, uh, doing it out the long, which wasn't really that bad because the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus t squared is just the arc tangent. And, uh, and then taking the derivative of that, I think that checks out with what you got using about the that? theorem, which is really nice. Really cool. So, so um, we're going to take a look at uh, that plotting that relation uh, using the TI Inspire. Uh, you know, the if you look here, you can see that I'm using the TI Inspire CAS 
but you can plot these relations on any Inspire. Now, if you want to actually do some symbolic calculus uh, with it, then you would need to cast. But let's just uh, look at the graph here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'll go ahead and insert a graphs page. And um, let's go to, let's see, we're not really plotting a function. We're going to be plotting a relation. So I'm pulling up the relation. And you see that REL1 of XY. And I'm literally going to type in exactly the uh, equation that um, Steve was looking at. So I think it was 4X cubed minus 4Y equals Y to the fourth power. And let's see how, about that? how things looked. And I think it ended up looking uh, pretty nice. Let's see, you've got that vertical tangent here. And as you said, it looked like there might be a couple of horizontal tangents. There, oh, the, the stuff you see flashing is just when I have my cursor close to the, uh, the graph. It's showing me what that, it's reminding me what that equation was that I had plotted there. So, Tom, yes, Steve, we just had a comment come in from, uh, from Miss Strick, uh, Sarah Strick. She mentions that the other roots are imaginary, and I was looking at that earlier. The uh, one plus y cubed, kind of trying to think about that in my own head, uh, realizing that that uh, there probably should only be the one sort of real root of that um, because we don't have the quadratic uh, piece there and we're not going to get uh, the typical sort of uh, cubic uh, piece, you know, that, that in-between curve, if you would. Uh, and so I, I'm glad that she brought that up, that the other roots are imaginary, because I was thinking, man, there's the other two roots have got to be there somewhere. But <laughs> he's right. The uh, imaginary piece had uh, had missed me on that. Very good, Sarah. In fact, sure, you can factor that. There is a way to factor that cubic or sum of cubics. And if you take a look at the remaining quadratic, you'll get a negative expression under that radical. Excellent, Sarah. Great. Sorry, Tom. Oh, no worries. Yeah. Yeah, I wondered if anybody was thinking of uh, kind of just thinking about what the graph was, if they kind of switched the variables, y equals x cubed plus one. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And y equals x cubed just crosses the x-axis at the origin. Mm -hmm. And if you raise that graph up by one unit, it's still going to cross just once and be increasing the whole time. So uh, another way to think about that only having one real root. Okay, I'm going to return to the, the Inspire here and go back to this calculator page and actually do an, a, an implicit derivative. Now, this is a functionality that would require a cast. So I just want to be upfront about that. But let's just take a look at what that might look like. Uh, that here. other graph didn't require cast, though, right, Tom? You were just right. No, I, the, I think you uh, graph those without, uh, without cast. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of calculus here. And let's see, we've got things, a lot of things to choose from. Let me scroll down. It looks like there's some more down here. Ah, implicit differentiation. That's the one I wanted to take a look at. And let's see, I think I, oops. Sorry, I kind of uh, slipped off my cursor there. There we go, implicit differentiation. And I'm going to put in that uh, equation again. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, type it in straight away again. Just so, let's see, it was four X cubed. Mm -hmm. And we had minus four Y. And then we had equals, Let's see, our equals, and it was y to the fourth. Right. And I'm going to put in uh, 
Y is going to be, I'm going to do this just a little bit different than Steve. I'm putting in the variable of differentiation here, but I'm actually putting in Y as the variable of differentiation. And then um, we're going to look at what the derivative of X would look like with respect to Y, given that relation. Voila, so this is looking at DX, DY. And if you look at that, that's actually just the reciprocal. This is what's kind of cool about Leibniz notation for derivatives. It is the reciprocal of dy over dx. But what we can think of now is for dx dy for a vertical tangent, we would be wanting to look at where this would be equal to zero. Okay. And again, now notice now we're looking at, okay, y cubed plus one equals zero. So we're really gonna end up doing the exact same things that Steve was doing, uh, except that we've expressed this now as dx over dy. Y would have to be equal to negative one to make the numerator zero. You gotta be a little bit careful that if for this to actually be zero, we wouldn't want a, some kind of indeterminate form. So um, we'd have to check that the point on the graph where y is equal to negative one, we're not getting a uh, denominator equal to zero. Okay, so we're ending up with uh, dx over dy uh, and getting that same analysis. Uh, if we wanted to do implicit differentiation of dy over dx, I'm just gonna echo that back down here and edit this a little bit. Uh, let's see, let's see. Do, uh, Delete there, I'll just interchange the X and the Y. And there's our dy over dx. And let's see, where would we have a horizontal tangent? Well, that would be where three X squared would be zero. So X would have to be zero. I think that makes sense with what the graph would look like. Uh, but then we'd want to see, well, what y values would go with x equals zero. So that for, to figure out those values, I'd want to go back and solve this equation here when x is equal to zero, solve it for y. Okay, so let's try that. And I think that's actually a little bit of algebra. I'm going to solve. And I'm gonna put in zero for X here. So I think we're just gonna uh, solve negative for Y. Oops, does that have to be the negative rather than minus? It does on the um, TI-84. But not you here. Be a little bit careful of the distinction between a negation and a, a subtraction sign. Yes. Uh, but this minus sign works both ways. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, that's cool, very cool. So it's a, a bit more forgiving. Yes, <laughs> I like that. So we're gonna solve minus four Y equals Y to the fourth for Y. Ah, so we get this negative two to the two thirds power or Y equals zero. I'm gonna go back to my graph here. Okay, so that's corresponding. Here's the y equals zero. So when x is zero, y could be zero, makes sense. And the other value, this is evidently that negative two to two thirds power. So, so it just makes sense from, a, from an eyeball point of view. Okay, so uh, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Steve, unless uh, Curtis or Steve Thanks. would like me to comment on anything else at this point. Sounds good. Cool. Anything from the chat, Curtis, that we should talk about? Okay, I will. Uh... Nothing so far. Okay. And let's see, to stop sharing. I ah, got it. There we go. Stop share. All right. Okay, we're going to go over here. Here we go.
All right, this is one of my favorite types of problems here that involves definite integrals. And I apologize, Curtis, I did not put a name on the right-hand side, but there was actually a question similar to this on Facebook. And I think, so. I think these are all your favorite types of problems. <laughs> I haven't seen you. I haven't seen you. Uh, okay, I get too excited that, about this uh, stuff. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and and hey Tom, uh, just heads up. I think there are probably quite a few folks out there who are using eighty four. Uh, so we might want to look at some of these ideas with uh, CE here in in a minute. Okay. Okay. Well, this is a good problem that involves uh, a graphical analysis here and relating this to definite integrals. And I think there's some cool concepts in here. I'm going to ask for a little literary license. This is the graph of a function f. And what I've done is I've put in some numbers here that indicate the areas of the regions bounded by the graph of f and the x-axis. So the area underneath the graph of f between minus 4 and minus 2 is 15. And again, give me a little bit of literary license here. That's a 5, that's a 4, 7, and a 10. Okay, so given all of that, I'd like to see if I can determine the value of each of these definite integrals. So I apologize, Curtis, I might have to kind of flip back and forth between the definite integral and the graph. The first couple I think are pretty straightforward just to get us going, but then the next couple we may have to think a little harder about. The integral from zero to four of f of x dx. Well, I wanna go from, whoops, where did that come from? Hang on one second. There we go. I wanna go from zero to four. Where's zero? Right there to four. I wanna integrate here, f of x. Well, let's see. You have to think about what happens here as we integrate and the function f is below the x-axis. So I, I know that Tom gives me trouble about this correctly all the time. I don't want to say negative area, but the area underneath that graph, bounded by that graph in the x-axis is seven, but it contributes minus seven to this definite integral. So this is minus seven plus 10, positive, because f is above the x-axis there. And so that gives me a plus three. How about if I want to go minus two to two? of f of x dx. Again, another kind of straightforward one. I just have to be careful here. Where is f below the x-axis? What's contributing a negative value here as a positive? See, I'm gonna to try to arrow up just a little bit more and see if I can get this right. Let's see, that would be a minus five plus a four minus a seven. Did I do that right? I think for a minus eight, how about that? That's a nice problem. And now we've got to think about this one a little bit more here. The integral from minus four to zero of the absolute value of f of x, minus four to zero. Well, let's see, we're only interested on this half. Let's see, what's the absolute value of f really do? Well, I'm gonna scribble a little bit here. My picture is gonna get a little bit messy. What would the graph of the absolute value of f look like from minus four to zero? Well, these two pieces would be the same, but this would get reflected above the x-axis like that, and the area up there would be five. So I think that value is going to be 15 plus a five plus a four for 24. How about that? And I'm sorry, there's an extra comma in there. We'll fix these typos here in the final version. Now I wanna put the absolute value symbols on the outside there. And I wanna find the absolute value of this definite integral. Well, okay, that's gonna be the absolute value. Let's just go back up here and read off these areas correctly and attach a positive or negative sign. Let's see, you've got that etched in your mind here. That's gonna be a 15. I think a minus five plus a four. So what does that work out to be? Just a 14 inside. Well, that's easy. The absolute value of 14 is just 14. Cool. 
All right, E and F are interesting, and I might just do E and leave F as a as a challenge. Just let some people work on work on that when some of the students work on that one. I know that Mark Corrali is looking at E, saying, "Wow, there's some cool symmetry in there," and I know he can do that, do it that way. I'm going to try a couple of gory details on this one. Here's the first thing I'm going to do. You know, when I see an absolute value symbol in a calculus problem, the first thing I think about is I want to work to get rid of it. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to split this up into two separate integrals. There's minus four to zero, f of the absolute value of x, and I get that right, dx, plus the integral from zero to four, f of the absolute value of x dx. That's OK. That's a property of definite integrals. That's fine. I'm going to take a look at this part here first, this integral first. That's the easier one. Remember my sort of, sort of naive way of problem solving this kind of a problem. I want to get rid of those absolute values if I can. Well, over the interval 0 to 4, x is positive. So how do I take the absolute value of that? It is just the argument x. So this definite integral just becomes the integral from zero to four of f of x dx. And I think, I think I did that somewhere up here, didn't I? I did, son of a gun. Boy, it's nice the way this works out. That's a three. So I've got part of this already. Now, what do I do with this one? I'm going to attack this in a similar way. Over that integral from minus four to zero, the argument here is negative. So how do you take the absolute value of that? You have to take the opposite of it. So this becomes the integral from minus 4 to 0 of f of minus x dx. Now, I know, Curtis, that there are some students out there looking at this, and they can see geometrically what to do. I get it. You're much better at this than I am. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a change of variables, because I think that results in something kind of cool, too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let u equal minus x. Very simple change of variables. du is minus dx. Let's see, this is a definite integral. So I have to know what u does to minus 4. Well, it takes the opposite of it. So it brings it to 4. And u of 0 is 0. Bear with me. I think something cool happens here. So this is equal to. I'm going to bring everything from the x world into the u world. So the bounds become now 4 to 0. This becomes f of u. And dx is going to be a minus du. Yikes. All right. Two steps in one here. Watch this. There's a minus sign here. I'm going to switch these bounds because I want the smaller bound down below. That means I'm going to introduce another negative sign. So the two negatives will give me a positive. This is going to be 0 to 4 of f of u du. And son of a gun, this is a dummy variable. That's the exact same thing as I have up there. So that's just 3 also. And this final answer here is 6. That's a cool problem. I'll let you think a little bit about f. Uh, you might think about a change of variables there, although, again, there might be some nice, better geometry that you can relate from that integrand up to the graph. But think about a change of variable, too. Cool problem. All right. This one was sent in or was on Facebook uh, from Judy Mitchell Barnett. This is a great problem. This has got probably every conceivable <laughs> limit concept involved. And it has four graphs given to us here, a graph of f, g, h, and j. And it asks us to find some limits or state that the limits do not exist. I'm going to do some of these. I'm going to leave some of these to our listeners. And Tom is going to take a look at a couple of them also. I think the way that this problem was designed that we're being asked to evaluate these limits or decide that they don't exist by simply looking at these graphs. Now, I apologize for this. Some of these limits I'm going to look at, I'm going to answer kind of loosely. I'm not going to answer this with very good notation. I apologize for that. Probably not accepted on the AP exam. But there's some great concepts going on here. Let's try A. 
the limit as x goes to minus two of j of x. Well, wait a minute, I gotta find, where the heck is j of x? Here it is, that's the graph over here on the right-hand side. What happens as x goes to minus two? Well, I guess the way that I have to answer that is to look at what happens as x goes to minus two from the left and from the right. And Tom and I kid about this and discuss this frequently, you know, maybe, maybe this graph of j, we should add a couple of things in here to describe this graph a little bit more precisely, but we're going to assume that those dashed lines in there are asymptotes. So as X approaches minus two from the left, as X approaches minus two from the right, the graph of G is, uh, pardon me, of J is increasing without bound. It's going in some sense to the same place from the left and from the right. And so this answer is, I'm gonna emphasize this is plus infinity. Now, I know we may get a question about this, Curtis. Can you say here that it does not exist? Yes, that's correct. But this does not exist behavior we can characterize more specifically. We can say it's equal to plus infinity. Some people have a, a problem with writing equal infinity here. You know, Curtis, Tom, and I don't really have a problem with that. That is mathematical notation that we all understand as mathematicians. It describes the long run, or describes, pardon me, the behavior of this function j near minus two on both sides. Cool. Now, again, this is a great problem. Let's contrast that with part B, where we take a look at the limit as X goes to one of J of X. So I got to come up to this graph here. This time as X approaches one from the left, the function is going off to plus infinity. And as we approach one from the right, it's going down here to minus infinity. So in that case, the limit from the left and the limit from the right are different. The behavior on the left and on the right is different. And so I believe that the answer here has to be does not exist. Cool, I'm gonna try one or two more of these and then I'll hand it over to Tom. Okay, look at C, the limit as X goes to minus one of F of X minus two divided by J of X quantity squared, holy Toledo. Well, again, I'm going to analyze this by looking at the graphs kind of loosely. But just to be a little bit more precise here, not in writing, but at least in speaking. In order to evaluate that limit, I might split it up as the limit of the numerator divided by the limit of the denominator. But remember, we can only do that if the limit in the numerator and the limit in the denominator exist. So I'm going to kind of assume that loosely as I try to analyze this limit, all right? Let me draw a fraction bar. Let's see, I don't know which one is easier to do. Let's look at the denominator first. Can we see that one? As X approaches minus one from the left and from the right, what's the function J doing? Well, son of a gun, it looks like it's zeroing in on the same value right here it looks like it's zeroing in on minus one. So that means the denominator is going to minus one squared. There are several properties of limits going on there. Now, what about up here in the numerator? Let's see, the limit as X goes to minus one, I've got to shift a little bit and look at, what is it, F of X. Okay, so I'm over on this left-hand graph. As X goes to minus one, what's F of X doing? Well, as X goes to minus one from the left and the right, well, cheapers, F is constant at minus one. So it's zeroing in at my, in fact, it's continuous there. So this is minus one minus that constant two. So let's see, do I get a minus three over one? How about that for a minus three? Wow, cool stuff there. I'm gonna put a little asterisk next to D because this is a very nice problem. I really like this one. And I'm gonna introduce a little bit of notation here. This is the limit as X goes to infinity of a composition, H of J of X. So here's how I'm gonna attack this. I'm gonna to try to see what J of X is doing as X goes to infinity. 
And I'm going to write this as the limit as t goes to some undetermined value yet here of h of t. I want to see what this inner function is doing. What's it going to, if anything, as x goes to infinity? Well, let's see. As x goes off to infinity, what's h? Oops, sorry about that. Get rid of that. As x goes to infinity, j of x. Boy, I got a lot of things popping up here. Sorry about that, Curtis. As x goes to infinity, what's j of x doing? Well, let's see. On the graph, it's going out here. It's getting closer and closer and closer. Looks like to 2. Ah, but how here? Let's be careful. It's getting closer to 2 from the left-hand side. So now I need to look, shift a little bit, look at this graph of H, and I need to consider the limit as T goes to two from the left of H. So let's see. Cheapers, don't know what happened there. Sorry about that one, Curtis. Let's try that again. There we go. You got the gremlins tonight. I know. Cheaper. Sorry about that. As T goes to oh, two from the left hand side. I'm seeing uh, positive three. Is that right? Excellent, Curtis. Right on the nose. As we approach two from the left hand side, what's H doing? It is approaching three. Fantastic. That's terrific. Hey. I'm proud. I worked that one out. <laughs> All right. I'm going to do one more, and then I'm going to turn it over to Tom to take a look at one specific one. Let's take a look at E just for a second, if we can. The limit as X goes to three, I like these composition ones. Not sure why. Once again, I'm going to take a look at, if I can, the limit as T goes to some undetermined value yet here of F of stuff, F of T. As X goes to three, what's happening to G? Let's see. Is F... As x goes to 3, what happens to g? Well, let's see. As x goes to 3, g looks like it's getting closer. Well, g first, it's continuous. It's getting closer and closer to 2. But I better be precise here. It's getting closer and closer to 2 from the left-hand side. So now i got to shift a little bit and look at f. What happens as we approach two from the left-hand side? It's going to minus one. Wow, there's some great problems in here. Excellent problems. I'm gonna put a little asterisk next to this one. That's a very cool problem. The tendency there, if you look at that quickly, would be to say that that limit does not exist. I do not believe that's true. Let me take a quick look at K and I'll turn it over to Tom with this one. This is kind of interesting, the limit as x goes to 1.5 or 3 halves. Well, wait a minute. What's happening in the denominator as x goes to 3 halves? The denominator here is going off to 0. I get that right? Yeah, 3 halves. Yep. And what happens as x goes to 1.5? i got to sneak back up here. Uh, wait a minute. 1.5. G is going to 1. Uh-oh. So that numerator is going to zero. How the heck are we going to solve this one? Oh, boy, I'm going to leave that one as sort of an open question. And I'm going to turn that over to Tom to take a look at that, I think, graphically, Tom? That's right. I'm going to take All a look right. at that uh, using the uh, TI-84. Very cool. Okay, All there right. you go. Okay, so I'll... Uh, Steve, while uh, Tom is pulling that up... Um, who is it that, that posted those questions? Uh, I have Judy Mitchell Barnett. I think she got this problem. I, I don't, I apologize. I don't know where she got this problem. I don't remember, but this is a, this is a great problem. It is a great little problem. It set. is. Mark's There's some probably, really nice stuff. Yeah, Mark, uh, if you're listening, uh, mark that down. This is a good problem, Mark. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so you guys tell me, uh, are we seeing my TI-84 screen okay here? Yeah, you are good. Okay. Um, so um, in looking at these problems graphically, uh, 
you know, did need to try to figure out some kind of a split formula analytic uh, uh, definition for these functions so I could actually graph them on the 84. And if you wanted to graph them on the Inspire, you would also need to do uh, something like that. Uh, I've already uh, graphed uh, the functions that um, Steve labeled as G and H. So G is this red graph. And you can't, you might not be able to see it, but there's a little red dot right up here at zero comma two. So if we even uh, trace this, you can see on the red graph when X is zero, Y is two. And it, but as soon as I move off of zero, it goes and it's on this uh, thing that looks like a, uh, it's an inverted uh, translation of an absolute value kind of function, okay? Uh, the black graph, this is the one that was labeled H. And as far as I could tell, it looked like a, a two pieces of uh, parabolas. And so that's what I've graphed there. Now I haven't graphed the simplest one, which was F. I'm not even gonna try to touch J here because uh, um, I'd have to sit down and really think about <laughs> What is that analytic formula? But these, these ones that are in pretty straightforward pieces, uh, how do you graph those um, or even just define them? So I'm gonna to go to the Y equals menu and you can see that I've already uh, done the work for Y2, Y3. Y2 is the function, the graph for G. Y3 is the graph for H. And as I mentioned, uh, Y3, it was made of a couple of pieces of parabolas. And you can see this is pretty much like it shows up in a textbook. You have a formula and the domain for which those, what domain values does that formula apply? And for G, we get the value two just when X is equal to zero. And then for all other values, it was basically uh, this uh, function of uh, basically a shifted and translated uh, absolute value for x not equal to zero. Now I've left y1 blank so we could try uh, f. And f is a very, very super simple function. It's just a step function. It's equal to the constant negative one when x is less than two, and it's equal to the constant three when x is greater than or equal to two. So just wanted to show how you could enter that. There's a couple of different ways. Um, on the 84 CE, if we go to the math menu and scroll down, we'll see there's a piecewise feature there. So I'm going to enter that. And then let's see, we just have two pieces. So I've gone down to two, it looks okay now. And it sets up this little template. So now I can, uh, let's see, put in the two pieces. I think it was negative one was the formula for x less than two. And I'll pull that off of the, the less than symbol. There it is on number five. It's less than two. Um, it's equal to positive three. And on the test menu, um, there's also these conditions. And notice that 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 even puts in the X for you. So I'll put in the three there, X greater than or equal to two. And now if I graph that, uh, it looks pretty nice. Um, and um, we can see that, uh, I think it has the shape that we want. It's kind of curious that how it, uh, would you graph both F and H together? How <laughs> oh, he's hooked up, okay. All right, so Steve uh, had called attention to this uh, one where we actually had, uh, hope I'm not letting the cat out of the bag here, Steve, but it's kind of an indeterminate form, right? We had the zero and the numerator and the denominator. Yes, uh, yes, let me focus our attention on the function we're really interested in. And that was just G. So I'm going to deselect Y1 that I just defined. And let's just look at graph of G. Okay, so this is that function that looks like this uh, inverted V 
with this one point where there's a hole and a point redefined there at x equals zero. Um, and I think the limit we were looking at was g of x, the numerator was g of x, this function minus one, right. the denominator was the quantity two x minus three. So I'm gonna go back to my y equals menu and actually define that as a new function in y4. So y4, my numerator is going to be y2 of x, Uh, minus one, remember my y2 is our g, and we're gonna divide by the quantity two times x minus three. Okay. Now, if you just would plug in or uh, look at this um, as x is approaching 1.5, I think that was the, the key value, at 1.5, g of x was equal, g of 1.5 was one, so our numerator is zero, but two times 1.5 is three, so we get three minus three is zero in the denominator. But what does the graph of this function look like? I'm gonna deselect, um, or what do you think? Should I leave y2 on or deselect it? I'll go ahead and deselect, I think. So we'll look at a graph. Oh, very wild. Look at this. Yeah. Some very strange stuff going on. And part of it you may miss because of the y-axis, but this magenta graph, there is a point down here. Right there. Let's go ahead and do a trace. It says when x is zero, I get negative. I'm guessing that's actually negative one third. But remember, that's that one spot where G had the little blip on it on the graph. Okay, so its value was actually two at zero. So two over negative three is, wait a second, is that right? Two. Oh, one point five, we should. Oh, one point five. Yes. Yeah, yeah, what's going on there? G of one point five. Two minus one, Tom. What's Don't that? forget your numerator is uh, yeah. y of x minus oh, one. Oh, right. So it's two minus one. So it's one over. One over. Negative three. Negative, negative three, one which third. Is Thank negative you, one. Chris. Yeah, I completely, I was just concentrating on the g there. Okay. Now, what we were interested in was what's happening at 1.5. Right. So I'm going to go ahead and jump to 1.5. Well, <laughs> nothing, right? It's undefined there. That makes sense because uh, my denominator certainly is zero. Um, so it's not going to be defined there. Um, but if we approach, let me back off a little bit. If we approach 1.5, notice it looks like it's a constant one third. So we hit 1.5, we don't get a value there. To the right side of 1.5, it's also equal one third. So just based graphically, what I'm seeing here is my best guess is the limit looks like it's positive one third. Now, I'm not gonna say that's a proof, we shouldn't trust this, but we should, you know, if we analyze this using, oh, who knows, L'Hopital's rule perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll come up with one third. And I did a little bit of the, too much of the cat out of the bag on that one. So, um, all right. I think Very good. I have just about exhausted our time. So let me uh, share this back out. Let's do a stop share. There we go. Back over to Steve. Thanks, all right. Curtis. Very good. Excellent. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Steve. Uh, this was really good. Thank you, Allison, again uh, for this evening. And I do just want to uh, make one mention. Uh, we have uh, organized the ability for uh, teachers um, to get uh, some level of uh, credit hours 
uh, for this. So I'd be uh, happy if, uh, if you uh, attended this evening and you need to uh, get some, uh, you know, you want to turn this in for uh, uh, hours after school, uh, we, can, uh, we can definitely give you a certificate for having watched this one hour uh, session. So uh, let me know. My email address will be in the chat box there. Um, we can take care of that and help you out uh, generating that. Uh, for future reference, we'll be doing that um, ongoing uh, from here on out. So just a heads up. Uh, and uh, I just want to put in one more plug. We've got uh, one more session uh, coming up this fall uh, here uh, in a few weeks, uh, looking at, uh, at uh, our last session coming up. Uh, really excited about that. Uh, and then uh, we'll be looking forward to the spring. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, Tom. Uh, for this evening, and uh, we'll see you guys in a few weeks.